All right, so again, welcome to our UCOP meeting. We're very excited. I, we know it's a cold morning and it's difficult to get out of the house, right? But we thank you for your time and we thank you for being here. My name is Rebecca Morales. I'm the Executive Director for Federal and State Programs and we have a great meeting for you today. Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, introduce and thank a couple of people. If my staff can uh, raise their hand, we have a lot of our staff members from our department that are here that that have worked very hard preparing this event for you and you see all these beautiful decorations um, that uh, that my staff has has worked on because they wanted to make sure that this was special for you parents because we do appreciate you um, before we also move on i want to thank we have our district translators that are here uh, we have our ID, itv department that is helping us record this event and also uh, make sure that it is available to some of our parents at home that are participating via zoom so uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and, and start this presentation. We have a very special guest with us here this morning, Ms. San Juanita Guerra from SCAN, uh, Project Border Launch, I believe, <laughs> who, who is going to be sharing some information with you about, obviously, these are current issues and, uh, that we're dealing with, mental, mental health, ours, our children's our communities, and so she's gonna be talking to you about that and also some services that they provide in our community. So please help me welcome again, Ms. Guerra. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Good morning. Um, my name is San Juanita Guerra. I am an LPC, I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I do work for SCAN, and I'll tell you a little bit more about SCAN in a little while, but I work for a very specific program under SCAN, which is known as Border Project Launch, and we work with children zero to eight, as well as their parents and caregivers in the area of mental health. And so um, I was very excited when uh, UISD invited us, invited our program, invited myself to come and speak to you all on this very, very important topic because so often we're so focused in the day-to-day -day responsibilities and duties, especially as parents and caregivers. Um, you know, we're very quick to run to the doctor when we get sick or our child gets sick, right? Right now we're dealing with a lot of things, right? We're hearing about RSV and COVID is still there and um, the flu, and we're very quick to run to the doctor. But when it comes to our mental health, we tend to ignore, to hope that it goes away, to hope that the child will outgrow it. It's just a phase, right? But in my work, in my experience as a therapist and as a mental health consultant, nothing is a face. Okay? I'm also a parent. I have a three-year-old going on 13. And um, so I also recognize the challenges and the struggles that parents and caregivers go through every day. So I hope that today will be informative, insightful, and that you'll walk away with some really good information Maybe doing a little bit of self-reflection if anything's going on with you or your children. And then, of course, the most important message at the end of all of this is please do not hesitate. Please do not hope that this will just disappear and get the help that you need because um, Laredo is not the Laredo that it was 10 years ago. There are resources here now. We are here now. And so um, I'll be sharing with you all all the services that we have, which are free, um, towards the end of the presentation. All right. So just to get down to basics, what is mental health? Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, right? In other words, how do we get by in the world we live in and through our lives? It affects the way we think, the way we feel, and obviously it's gonna directly affect how we behave, how we act, the things that come out of our mouths, how we treat other people, how we see ourselves, right? And it also helps determine how we handle our stressors and relate to other people. Have you ever met somebody who 
can not deal with stress? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the couples in the room are like, right? Yeah. And so typically when I meet um, somebody, an adult, who has a really hard time dealing with stress and coping with everyday stressors, I always think to myself, hmm, this person was probably not taught how to deal with their feelings as a child. So that's where we come in as parents, as caregivers, is we are here to guide our children how to deal with their emotions. Because they may be little, but they've got big emotions and they've got all of them, right? And so um, I often, you know, in the morning when I wake up, I have a three-year-old and I'm like, what's gonna be the meltdown this morning? Is it gonna be over wearing the blue tennis shoes or the pink tennis shoes, right? Um, but they're big emotions. And so it's very important that we be able to cope with our own emotions, our own stressors, our own difficulties. Because if not, it's just impossible to then deal with whatever our child might be facing. So very, very important to take care of your mental health. This is the way we want to see it. As much as you take care of your physical health, you want to give that same care and attention to your mental health. It's equally important, and they go hand in hand. If we do not take care of our mental health, there could be physical ailments to come. People suffer from migraines, chronic headaches, um, high blood pressure, right? Um, low blood pressure, dizziness, things like that. So they go hand in hand. Just in the United States, about 50% of the population in their lifetime will be diagnosed with a mental health condition, right? And that sounds like a lot of, that's half, that's half of us, okay? So if I were to divide this room right in half, that means half of us have something, right? But I think one thing to keep in mind is when we talk about mental health, we're not necessarily always talking about psychiatric conditions, right? We live in Laredo, and I've been in this field since like 2005. And um, at, when I started in my career, people would tell me, no, 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 yo no estoy loco. I'm not crazy. And I would tell them, I have never treated a crazy person. I've treated a person who needs some help, who needs some guidance, who needs some information to make better decisions, right? but I've never treated a crazy person, right? I've treated a person who's unwell, right? But we've come a long way in this community, right? There's still a lot of stigma over mental health and getting help, but we're, we've definitely broken down some barriers in the last 20 or so years. And especially, like I said, with resources um, coming into our community. So, now I want to dive deep into what is infant and early childhood and mental health. How many of you have children under the age of eight? Okay. How many of you have children under the age of 15? Majority, okay. How many of you have the really little ones, five or less? Okay, okay. I love to talk to parents who have children in the, in the, in the, um, what we call the incredible years. Incredible years is from zero to five, from the moment they're in your womb to the moment they, they come out and then they're five years old. Because this time in the life of a child is golden. It's golden territory for any caregiver and parent, right? Because it's where we give them that foundation for the rest of their lives, for the rest of their lives, all right? So, um, but for those of you that have teenagers, oh, we're gonna get into that too, don't you worry. All right, you're like, help me. What do I do with this kid? Um, so, but first let's go with the little ones. Infant and early childhood mental health refers to the ability of babies and young children to deal with their emotions, to develop relationships and to learn. Because this is the tender age where they start school, right? Um, and so it's very, very important to be very aware, very alert of what our little ones are doing, how are they developing, right? 
especially socially. How are they getting along with other members of the family compared to peers in school, compared to their teachers, right? And I'm gonna tell you something that we're noticing right now. COVID-19 has had many, many consequences on this world. Not just the fact that many of us have lost loved ones or jobs or other things, you know? But one thing that has happened is that with the really, really young children, we call them COVID babies. Either they were born during COVID or they were very young when COVID hit, right? So what happened to these children? What did we do as parents? We sheltered them. We sheltered them because we had to. That is not a criticism. It's what we had to do to protect our children. I mean, vaccines for these little ones barely came out like less than a few months ago. We had to do what we had to do, but that is having consequences on our children. So whereas before COVID, it was very common to see, you know, speech delays. Speech delays are a very common thing. You know, don't, don't, don't freak out when, if your child has a speech delay. It's not the end of the world. There's things we can do. Um, that's why they're speech therapists. Um, but we're not seeing necessarily a change in speech delay. We're seeing what I like to call a delay in communication skills and socialization ability. So I'll let that sink in a little bit. Which means our children lack that skill, those interpersonal skills to communicate with others and to socialize because they've been sheltered at home with all adults. So they come to school for the first time, pre-K, kinder, right? And they don't know how to respond to that environment. And I know this because I work very closely with teachers. I actually go to every Head Start in town. So if you have kids in Head Start, they know me. Um, I go visit all the Head Starts and they're struggling. It's December and the teachers are still struggling. Whereas before, you know, we would give it the first six weeks of school and it was, oh, I let them adapt. They've never been to school before. No, it's, we're seeing something else. So, because we as parents made a decision to shelter these children, because we had to, we had to. It is now our responsibility to catch up, to help them catch up. Okay? And there's many ways to do that. And I'm going to talk about one thing in a little bit that I, I love sharing what I'm about to share with you guys. Because I, when I first heard about it, it just blew my mind, especially as a, as, a, as a mother. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. Not sure if it's... It's not skipping ahead. There we go. I figured it out. Yeah. There's always multiple ways to do this, don't worry. All right, so the first thing we wanna do as caregivers and parents is look for those early warning signs. Like I said, do not ignore things, do not brush it off, oh, they'll get over it. Uh, well, that's what three-year-olds do, that's what five-year-olds do, that's what 15-year-olds do. That is a way of excusing the behavior and that is dangerous territory because then we don't do anything about it until it's, the situation has gotten very, very serious. And I'm not saying there's not help at that point. Of course there is, but it's gonna be challenging than if we had intervened much earlier. So some of the warning signs to look out for, especially in young children, um, I'm speaking to uh, the parents of elementary age children. So persistent sadness for two weeks or more, if you just notice this sudden change in mood and they're, they're sad all the time, it's like, what's going on, okay? This is not my child, this, isn't, this used to be a very happy child, but now they're constantly sad or moody. If they start to withdraw from social, social situations, like you get invited to a party and they're like, I don't wanna go. Or, you know, we're gonna go to a big family party, it's Christmas, I don't wanna go. So if you start to see that a lot and that wasn't your child before, you've got to start questioning what's going on, what happened. Obviously, if they're hurting oneself, right, or, or talking about hurting oneself, 
Um, you want to be able to say, okay, what's going on? Why do you want to hurt yourself? Obviously, if there's talk of death or suicide, and I know you might say, what do you mean? You're talking about elementary age students. Yes. I had a case recently with a seven-year-old who made a declaration in the middle of his classroom that he was going to kill himself. Imagine what went through that parent's mind. Seven years old. Didn't want to live anymore. Said it in front of his classroom. Okay? They have these big feelings. Don't just think like, ay, es un niño, it's just a child. They're, they're fine. No, we have to take these things very seriously. Outbursts or extreme irritability. Everything bothers them all of a sudden. Hi, don't talk to me. I don't want to go. Leave me alone. Um, you know, they're not interested in anything. It's like, okay, why are you so mad? Why are you so angry all the time? Out of control behavior that can be harmful. Throwing things, having outbursts, breaking things for the sake of breaking them or to upset somebody else on purpose. Drastic changes in mood, behavior, and personality. Where you're just like, who is this child? This is not my kid. What happened? Right? That's what we put on our little investigative caps. Changes in eating habits or, or loss of weight or sudden weight gain. It goes both ways. Right? Are they not eating anything? They're refusing to eat? Is it because they're going through some sort of growth spurt or something else is going on? Or did they gain weight because, again, they're going through some sort of growth? Or are they just overeating because they're emotionally eating? Right? So what's going on? Difficulty sleeping. Obviously, if they're sleeping, um, they, they are having trouble going to sleep. Or they are sleeping too much. They're like, okay, this kid didn't use to nap anymore. And now he comes home from school and snaps for three hours. What's going on? Right? So unless they're in a new school activity that might be getting them tired, which would explain that, then it's like, okay, what's going on here? If they start to complain of pain, headaches, stomach aches, vomiting, this could be an early sign of an anxiety disorder, and changes, obviously, of their grades go down. And this was a child who was very doing very well academically. They would you know, make A, B honor roll, and all of a sudden, you're getting C's and D's and complaints from the teacher, right? Okay, what's going on? They've lost interest um, or focus in the classroom. And then, of course, just not wanting to go to school. I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, right? And there's many reasons why a child may not want to go to school. Parents often think, oh, you're being bullied, right? Which happens, of course it does, right? We have anti-bullying programs and all that other good stuff. But it's not the only reason a child may be avoiding going to school. Right? So we really have to dig deep, parents. What is going on here? And I think the biggest thing, because I, I work with parents so much, it's there's a fear of knowing what it is. Right? It's like, if I don't know what it is, uh, I can kind of like get through each day, day by day. But what if it is that my child has autism? My child has ADHD. My child has ODD. We'll talk about ODD in a little bit because a lot of people are like, what is ODD? Okay, ask a teacher. They know. <laughs> they deal with it. Um, so it could be something. And so the fear of such a diagnosis can be very intimidating for parents. But what I always tell parents is the more information you have, more power to you to be able to make informed decisions and do what you feel is best for your child, right? So don't be afraid of this um, information because, again, and these are the possible diagnoses. These are the most common diagnoses we make uh, for children. Um, anxiety disorders, very common, especially right now. COVID has done this too. Children are afraid to go to school because, wait a minute, you said for like two or three years, I couldn't even go to Target with you. We couldn't go to birthday parties. Everything was a drive-through. And we had to wear masks. And now you're saying that I can't go to school and I don't really have to wear my mask? Like, what, what, what? That's confusing for a child. 
What do you mean? Is COVID completely gone? Nobody else is going to die? We can't say that. That's not true, right? There's still people dying from COVID. There's still people getting sick, right? Not like before, but they are, right? So that's a very confusing thing. So at the start of this school year, we got a lot of reports of children just not adjusting well, just not wanting to go to school, not wanting to be there. Um, for kids that got to experience virtual learning the year before, or two years ago, they were like, why can't we just keep doing that? What's the big deal? I'm here, I can do this in my pajamas, and I don't have to deal with, you know, the teacher in front of me and classmates that annoy me or whatever. Um, so cre this created, has created a lot of anxiety issues for our children, right? The fear of being in the classroom. Uh, in a little bit, we are gonna talk about mass shootings. Another reason why kids don't wanna go to school, right? It's another big reason. Um, last year, we had a lot of cases of anxiety after what happened in Uvalde. And so, very reasonable. Again, they're, they're children, which means they are human and they have all the range of emotions that you and I have. So obviously they're gonna have fears. Obviously they're gonna have difficulties, all right? Another very common diagnosis, um, well, I'm gonna say another very common thing for which children are screened is ADHD or ADD but you'd be amazed, it's actually difficult to diagnose for ADHD and ADD. There's gotta be several things present. Not just, oh, he's so hyper, oh, he must have ADHD. No, it's a healthy kid who's hyper. Stop giving him candy and things with dye, you know, red dye in it. <laughs> Don't give him Coke, don't give him Big Red. Um, so, um, but we do work very closely with children with ADHD and ADD. Um, and a lot of it, it's, it's a lot of corrective behavior. And so we are able to work with parents who have children with ADHD and are also uh, with their physician getting the proper treatment. Autism spectrum, we are definitely seeing a lot more children on the spectrum for autism, okay? And what we often get the question of that is, why are more children being born with autism? And the answer to that is that no, there's not more children being born with autism. We've just gotten better at diagnosing it. Whereas you might have gone to somebody in high school and you were like, that person was really socially awkward. They probably had autism. We just wouldn't diagnose it before. That's the difference. It's not that more people are being born with autism now. It's just that we're getting better at diagnosing it and treating it and helping people be successful when they are on the spectrum. And why do we call it a spectrum? Because no individual with autism is the same. Some are very high functioning, some are very low functioning, and then you have everything in between, right? So accommodations can be made based on what they, they need. Eating disorders, uh, we see this mostly in adolescents, right? We, we start to see the eating disorders, whether it's uh, bulimia, anorexia, obesity, things like that. We see it a lot, um, um, binge eating and throwing up. We see that a lot in adolescents because what happens in adolescents? What was that? Puberty. Puberty. Okay, but what happens to a child's self-image? It gets twisted with everything that's all out there, magazines, um, mm -hmm. personal body ideas. Yeah, their image. And then nowadays with social media, are you kidding me? You know, I'm a kid of the 80s. I was a teenager in the 90s. I am so glad we didn't have social media. We barely, I think it was my senior year when we got like AOL email. <laughs> I remember that, you've got mail. Um, yeah, I'm so glad, but I'm scared for my daughter. Because if right now we have TikTok and all this stuff, what's gonna happen when she's 13 in 10 years? You know, I think I will move to the woods in a remote cabin. 
um, because, you know, these things are so powerful. And they're lies. Right? I always tell um, teenagers that sometimes I come across, I'm like, you do know what a filter is, right? She doesn't really look like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, there's all this information or propaganda or marketing about looking a certain way, and this affects an adolescent fragile mind, right? So um, we do see a lot of these eating disorders. Depression and other mood disorders, especially, uh, we do see a lot of um, children suffering from depression, adolescents, of course. Um, and this one, it's a tough one with depression because it creeps up on you. It starts off as like, oh, well, she was just a little blue, a little sad. Mm -mm. And before you know it, they don't have the motivation for anything. They're not interested in anything. They, don't, they lose touch with their friends. And you're like, whoa, where, when did this happen? Right? And it'll happen really quick. Um, and then, of course, post-traumatic uh, post stress. This is for any child that might have experienced or witnessed any type of trauma. And trauma, sometimes when we talk about trauma, we just think of, um, oh, were they sexually abused? Were they physically abused? Did they witness domestic violence? Um, and no, trauma can come in so many different forms. COVID is a trauma, right? Especially if the child lost somebody very close to them, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, a parent, right? That's, that's huge, that's a huge loss. So trauma really depends on how the person dealt with the event. Okay? So these are all the very, very common um, mental health conditions that um, we see amongst young children and that we do, um, we do treat. And so the most important thing is to get support. Like I said, you have to have to have that really um, investigative mind as parents, you know, what is going on? And even when you don't know, what I always tell parents is, when in doubt, get checked out, and if it's not what you thought, great, you ruled it out. But well, what if it is something, right? So that's always, always err on that side of caution, right? It's like right now, right? Kids are getting sick everywhere, right? So what do we do? We go to the doctor because we want to know what it is. Because I need to know what medication to give this child. I need to know how to protect other children that might be in the house. I need to let the school know that he's probably going to be out. So we take action. It should be the same thing with our children's mental health as well as yours. Take action. All right? And yes, there's um, us being able to have early diagnosis and treatment can really, really um, have either a positive or a negative effect, you know, in the child's home life, at school, and obviously forming relationships. So it's very, very important to get these things addressed. If not, their development will be affected. So let's talk about teenagers for a little bit. Let me see those hands again. How many of you have teenagers at home? Fun, right? <laughs> Well, you know, you always want to also remember that you were a teenager yourself once. So think about that feeling or those feelings, very complicated feelings. So poor mental health in an adolescent is more than them just being sad or, you know, oh, I don't want to do this today, mom. Um, it can impact a lot of areas of their life, especially school. Um, not to mention their decision-making abilities and obviously their physical health, especially if they do um, enter into risky behavior like, you know, an eating disorder or self-harm. And so, um, but one of the things that we see a lot with, um, with adolescents is, you know, they are going through a very difficult stage and not to their fault, right? If we get really into science and biology here, right? Talk about the brain. This part of the brain, which is the, 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 the frontal cortex right here, frontal lobe, it's not developed for teenagers. Does anybody know what the frontal lobe is responsible for? What function does it play in our lives? Logic and reasoning. Making smart, good decisions. Ah, 
that's why they keep getting in trouble. Yes, that's why. They don't have that yet. It's not developed yet. It doesn't fully develop till the early 20s. Okay? For men, early 40s. No, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> nunca, dice, nunca llegaron. Okay? But yeah, for, for, for girls, it, it's about age 21, and for men, about age 25. Okay? It takes a long time. Let me put it to you this way. Why will a rental company, like a car rental company, not rent to somebody under the age of 25? Male or female, they just won't rent you the car. You're more prone to accidents. You're a liability, because you're reckless. You're considered reckless, right? Most automobile accidents happen in people under the age of 25. There's a reason for that. They speed, they think they're, a mí no me va a pasar, it's not gonna happen to me, you know, whatever. So yeah, that's why, they, we, that's why there's that rule there, all right? So for teenagers, their frontal uh, lobe here is not developed at all, okay? So they lack the ability to make smart, good decisions or to think things through. They're very impulsive. Um, and mental health problems in teens, if not addressed, can lead to some really risky behavior, including drug use or experimentation, um, experimenting with um, um, or experiencing violence. You, 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 we, um, I, I used to work at the university for, for like 10 years, and sometimes and we did have some really young students there. We had a high school there and everything. And, and sometimes they would engage in very violent romantic relationships. Right? And so again, they don't have that um, self-esteem, that self-confidence to say, hey, this is wrong. I'm out, right? Even as adults, sometimes we can do that because it's difficult. Not to mention other high-risk behaviors involving sex, okay? Yes, kids are having sex. Okay, let's, let's all be realistic about that. <laughs> and so, obviously, sex can bring about many consequences such as contracting diseases like HIV or other STDs and obviously unintended or unwanted pregnancy, right? Now, we've got a whole other ball of issues to deal with, right? Not to mention, going back to the brain, they are not ready to deal with those consequences, right? So we want to be very, very um, involved um, with our kids. What are they doing? What's on their, who has access to social media? Who's on their social media? Who are they communicating with, right? And they may not like it. They might be like, you're invading my privacy, mom. Um, so be it. There was just that big national case where a young lady had a friendship with a teenage boy and it turned out that he was a grown man. He was like a trooper in Virginia. I don't know where he was from. And he drove to her home in California and killed her family and kidnapped her or tried to kidnap her. Right? But she thought she was communicating with, it, with another teenage boy her age, right? But there's predators out there. And then one thing that our kids don't, again, going back to logic, they just give away personal information. Yes, I live in Laredo at 202, you know, Travis Street. All you need is a Google map and you'll find the person, right? So we need to be very, very careful with what our kids are into. We need to be involved in their lives. And obviously, everybody here and everybody watching from home is. Because if not, you wouldn't be here. Right? So get involved in your, in your children's lives and activities. What can we do as caregivers, as parents? Well, for one, model healthy uh, coping skills. If you are unable to manage your own stress, your own anxiety, your own conditions, what kind of an example are you setting for your child? All right? So you've got to be that role model of good health, both physical health and mental health. Watch for behavior changes. Again, be very alert. Be very aware. Is there a sudden change? Hey, he wasn't doing that a week ago. What's going on? It's been going on for two, three weeks. This is not just an isolated incident. I need to look into this. Keep open, open and honest communication with your kids. 
If you don't talk to your kids, you just talk at your kids, you can expect them to come and talk to you. Okay? Do we know the difference between talking to our kids and talking at our kids? Right? Do you actually have conversations with them? Do you show interest in their lives? Right? Create a routine and set clear boundaries at home. Ah! We talk a lot about this uh, in the work that we do. We have uh, parenting education classes. And I am always amazed at how many times I ask a parent or caregiver, you know, they're complaining about the child's behavior at home, and I say, well, what are your rules? And they just look at me like, huh? <laughs> well, he knows he's supposed to behave. I'm like, no, he doesn't. As smart and as amazing as your gifted and talented child may be, you have to tell them what the limits are. You have to enforce those limits. In other words, stick to your word. And then two, there's got to be consequences if they go beyond those limits. Because the rules mean nothing if there's no consequences. Right? It's like I always tell parents, it's like if we have all these laws, but if you break the law, nobody goes to jail or anything. Oh, well, people will be breaking the laws everywhere. You know? Right? So you've got to enforce those limits and have consequences. And when I say consequences, I'm talking about positive discipline, right? Obviously, in my line of work, we would never recommend, much less condone, um, or agree of corporal punishment, spanking, hitting, nothing like that. Never, never getting physical with the child. There's many other ways to discipline your child where you don't have to touch them. Okay. Um, let them know that they are loved and supported. And I'm going to go a step further here and say accepted. Accepted for who they are. Okay. So your kid likes to dress in black. Okay. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Okay. So really, really for them knowing that they are loved and accepted and supported by their own family especially their parents. Provide positive feedback and encouragement. You know, praise your child when they are doing well, when they are behaving the way that you want them to behave, when they are doing good in school. Tell them. And don't just tell them, good job, excellent, high five. Because your child's going to look at you like, okay, but I did like 20 things today, so what are you talking about? You have to tell them for what? In our line of work, we call it label praising. You tell them why you are praising them. Good job putting your toys away like mommy asked. That's awesome. Ah. Have you ever been praised by a supervisor or somebody else? Feels good, right? If I know what I'm being praised for by my supervisor, guess what? I'm going to do that more often because I like how it feels. It's attention. Our children are more prone to repeat the behaviors for which they're getting attention. And when it's a young child, it doesn't matter if the attention is positive or negative. Okay? So whatever you give your most attention to, that's the behavior the child is more likely to exhibit more often. So if you're only focusing on your child when they're misbehaving or they get out of line, guess what? They're going to keep doing that. Because even though you're mad at them, even though you might be yelling... They're getting your attention. They don't get it otherwise. So they're going to keep doing that. Okay? Um, encourage joyful movement. Move. Move with your kids. Don't be the parent that says, De aquí te veo, mijito. Get up. Play with your child. Play with your child. Play with your children, with your teenagers. Play with them. Yes, play with them. A board game, something. Play with your kids. Get them off the tablet. The tablet is the enemy. Your phone is the enemy. If you wonder, why do I not have a greater relationship with your child? I dare you, I challenge you to track on a daily basis how long, much time they spend on a tablet or screen or whatever and how much time you spend on your phone. If it's more than one hour per person, you've got a problem. Okay? 
talk about um, emotions and feelings. If they have never heard you talk about emotions or feelings, they have no example of what that's like. Right? So I'm going to pick on the gentleman in the room again, and not on purpose. Just, just bear with me. I'm trying to make a point. In most cultures, including ours, we live in Laredo, we're predominantly Latino, more specifically Mexican or Mexican-American. Agreed? Agreed? Great. What do you, we tell boys in this culture when they express emotion? Don't cry. What else do we say? Los niños no lloran. Los varones no lloran. Los hombres no lloran. What else do we say to them? And you're being kind right now, because I've heard meaner things. Uh huh. Uh huh. Exactly. So basically, what you're telling that child is you are wrong in feeling the way you do. There's something wrong with you. So this child grows up, gets married, forms a family, and his partner says to him, Why can't you ever talk to me about your feelings? And this man just stares, and the real answer is because he was never allowed to. So he never learned how to. Let's switch roles. Women. What do we tell women when they are being very expressive about their feelings? They're PMSing. You're PMSing. What else? Que dramatica eres. You're so dramatic, right? Okay. So even though they receive a very different message than the boys did, it's still the same Message in the sense of stop it. You're wrong in feeling the way you do. You're not. Nobody is. It's your feelings. It's your assimilation of the situation. It's your perspective. You have a right to feel what you feel. What we don't have a right to is to act violently or wrongly based on those feelings. That's a different story. But everybody in here has the right to get upset. Everybody in here has the right to be, feel frustrated. Everybody in here has the right to feel sad or happy or joyful or excited. Everybody. Because they're human emotions. We're not robots. I don't want to be one. Right? I love my human life. Right? It's a gift. And so if we teach that to our children, that's who they will grow up to be. An adult who cannot process or express their feelings in a healthy way. So what do we see? Mental health problems. Relationship problems. A lot of divorce because people can't figure it out, can't communicate. Right? So very, very important that we be that model of how to talk about emotions and how to process those feelings. Um, involve them in, in the decisions that they're able to be involved in. Now, I will say that disclaimer. You're not going to involve your kids in every decision, obviously. But in whatever they can be involved in, okay? This Saturday, what should we do for fun as a family? Should we go to the movies or should we just order some pizza and watch something here? Or go to the park? What should we do? Involve them in the decisions that they're, they're able to be a part of. This allows them to feel that they were equally important as any other member of the family, okay? And then, of course, like I said, get professional help when it's necessary. Okay. What else can we do? Again, express your own feelings. Label feelings for children. We're going to talk about that right now. And play with your kids. I love this image of this dad. You know, He's doing his thing, but he's like, sure, girls, whatever. Go for it. He's got rollers in his hair, and the little girl, I think, is doing his nails. And, you know, just... Play with your kids. Allow yourself to be free with your kids. They love it. It's the power of play. Okay? And the relationship between children and their primary caregivers, most often it's their parents, but that's not always the case, right? We have all kinds of families. We have adoptive parents, foster parents, grandparents raising uh, uh, grandchildren. So whoever the primary caregivers are of this child, that relationship is the most vital relationship that child will ever have, good or bad. And it will impact how that child continues to develop, 
how they adapt to the world around them and who they end up becoming as adults. It is the most important relationship in their lives, right? It's like somebody once told me, um, because they didn't have a very, uh, um, their father had passed away and they didn't have a very good relationship with their mom. And they said, although I have a lot of friends and I'm married now and I have a lot of, you know, relatives on the side of my partner, I still feel alone. And I've always felt alone. And it's true. Because the relationship between us and our primary caregiver, are, it's the most vital relationships that we have in our life, right? And so it's so important that since our children are very young, that we really focus on what a foundation we want to give to that relationship, right? So you might be looking at me and saying, okay, that's a lot of pressure <laughs> as a parent. But that's our job. That's our responsibility. That's our duty. Okay? And it's the best gift we could give our kids. We may not always be able to protect them because they're going to grow up and leave your house, hopefully. You know, you don't want some 30-year-old living with you. Okay? Um, so the best thing we can do is give them this foundation where they can thrive on their own once they're not with us once they go off to college or they do whatever decisions they, they, they wish to do in life, right? And so we want to be able to, to have those connections with our kids. Again, seek, seek help. And help doesn't have to be like intense, professional, psychiatric help. It could just be guidance. It could just be information, right? It could be forming a support group with other parents. So there's many forms. It could be your school, your school counselor, they have resources. They can point you in the right direction, right? So get help however you, you find it. All right, so this is what I wanted to dive into, emotional literacy. I get really excited about this topic. Um, has anybody ever heard this term, emotional literacy? Okay, I see like one head shaking in the back. Emotional literacy, don't be intimidated by the name, it's basically us being able to provide our children with the words to express their emotions. Hence the term emotional literacy. Teach them the words. I often get a lot of cases with little ones, and little ones experience a lot of frustration. Right? Anybody have toddlers in the room? They get a lot, they get very frustrated and easily angry, and they'll push and shove and throw and hair pull and do all these things. And I get calls, you know, from the daycares, hey, we're about to kick this kid out because, you know, he's hair pulling everybody in here. And so one thing that I talk with parents about a lot is emotional literacy because it's about teaching children to express with words rather than their hands, right? And teachers are really good at this. They'll say, you know, use your words, don't use your hands. But at home, we could really use this, parents, okay? So it's basically teaching them beyond, are you happy, or are you sad? Because there's way more emotions in a human than happy and sad. There's frustrated, annoyed, irritated, excited, nervous, right? There's all these other emotions, and your kids have them. They just don't know what they are. And since they don't know what to call them or what to do with them, they lash out. Teach your kids the words. And there's a lot of things that we can do here. Um, they, they sell like little flashcards with emotions. And like, like here, like, you know, kids are familiar with emojis. Use, use emojis to your advantage. All right. Um, or, you know, there's books also on emotions. Get these tools, get these resources, right? Go to the public library, check some of these out, right? And talk to your kids about emotions. And when they are lashing out, say, hey, come here. And when you talk to a young child, I see some of you with young children here, how should you speak to a young child when you're talking to them? Right? Nos hacemos chiquito. Yeah, eye level. If I'm talking to a child like this, What's happening in the child? 
se intimidan, they're intimidated. They're not listening to what you're saying, they're just like this. Or you do that so often that they're immune to you now. And they're like, they're like uh, the Charlie Brown cartoons when adults speak, wah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what they hear. They're like, okay, yeah. ¿Ya terminaste? Okay, gracias. ¿Ya pudiera jugar? Okay, thank you. Okay, they're no longer listening to you. But if you get down at their eye level, you talk to them in a calm but firm voice, they are more likely to comprehend what you're saying and actually do it. But if you're yelling at them from another room, nothing's going to happen, right? So one thing is to talk to them when they're having an emotional dysregulation um, is, hey, I see that you're angry. I know. I would be angry too. So in that moment, I connect to the child. I know how that feels like. You have a right to feel the way you do, but you know what? We don't break things when we do that. We take a moment. We take some deep breaths. We talk about it. Why are you angry? Oh, it's because my brother took this. And uh, Oh, okay, yeah, I would be angry too. But let's, let's deal with this situation, right? So that's what we want to do when children are having very big feelings. We call them big feelings. You want to recognize the feeling. Don't tell them, ay, no estés llorando, no es para tanto. You're exaggerating. Sweetheart, that's not a reason to cry. Calm down. No. Don't offend the child. What happens to you if somebody tells you to calm down when you're very angry? What happens? Do you calm down? You get angrier. You get angrier. Because what I just heard from you is, oh, I don't have a right to feel this way, but I know I do because this just happened and this is how I felt about it. They're my feelings. Same thing with kids. So when kids are having big feelings, we want to get done at their level. We want to say, hey, I see that you're angry. Say it with me. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Oh, where do you feel it? Oh, I put it in my hands, in my stomach. Okay. I know. I know exactly how that feels. I feel like that sometimes too. But you know what? <sighs> let's take some deep breaths together. Let's, let's breathe together. <sighs> How many of you actually do deep breathing with your kids? It's magic for two reasons. One, you help the child physically relax. The muscles relax, the thoughts regulate. And you relax because <laughs> you are human too. As parents, we also get frustrated. We also get tired. We also feel helpless sometimes. Absolutely. So we all need that moment. If as a parent, you feel you're about to lose control, and even 20,000 deep breaths is not going to help you, you need to walk away. Okay? Sometimes mommy, daddy need 10 minutes in the bathroom. Dads usually need more. Oh, I tell my husband, what are you doing in there? It's been 30 minutes. But, um, but we, we just need... I'm really upset, so mommy will be right back. Go to the restroom, go have a private moment, breathe, calm down, come back and deal with it. Don't just ignore the problem either. The problem's still there, <laughs> whatever it was, right? But if you really feel you're about to lose control and you might say something you regret, it's just better to walk away. Even if the child is crying and thrown on the floor, say, mm, I'll give you some space while I give me some space, right? So, yeah, that's what emotional literacy is. Giving children the words and allowing them the opportunity to feel the way they do. So that when they grow up and they're in relationships, their partner won't have to say to them, how come you can ever talk to me about your feelings? They will have known all along their whole life that it is perfectly fine and okay to talk about their feelings and express feelings. All right. How are we doing on time? Okay. I'm going to switch gears here because I was asked to speak about school safety and how this affects also our children's mental health and, of course, parents' mental health. So let's talk about our reality, right? Mass shootings and gun violence. Every day we're hearing, you know, there was a shooting here, shooting there. And 
It is not our intention to bring this topic up, to bring up unpleasant things or to scare anybody. It's just to be more prepared as parents, right? How do we best speak to our kids about these things? Because trust me, they're hearing about it, they're wondering about it, and they're scared about it too, okay? So let's go into that. So when um, Uvalde happened, we got a lot of calls. Um, and um, obviously a lot of colleagues all over the state rushed to Uvalde to provide uh, support and mental health services to the community there. Um, and some of them are still there. There's a, a center now that's permanently there. Um, and so, you know, when this happens, it evokes a lot of emotions in all of us, right? One of them is obviously sadness. We're very sad for the loss that happened. Um, grief. We're grieving with these families, even though we might not have a direct connection. We, we feel it. Like, I remember feeling like as a mom, like if this happened to my daughter or me, what would I do? I told my husband, I think I would stop breathing and cease to exist. Like, that's the honest truth. Right? Um, you feel helpless because it already happened, so I can't do anything, right? And then, of course, we feel angry. Angry with um, lawmakers, angry, you know, just angry. We're angry, right? And this is all a process of, of, of grieving, right? And so children struggle with the same emotions, but even more so because especially for the little ones, this can be very confusing. Like, what do you mean? Isn't school like the safest place I can be besides home? You know, should I not go to school anymore? Maybe I should be homeschooled. Can we go back to online? You know, so they're dealing with the same emotions. So don't ever underestimate that like, oh, he's too little. He doesn't understand. Trust me, they understand. Let's say you are together as a family and you're talking about it and the children are over there playing. They're like, Hi, they're not listening. They're listening. They're listening, and they're listening to your tone, so they hear that you are upset, they hear that you're worried, they hear that you're angry, so they're taking all that in. And so they're going to need some guidance to, to process these emotions. You know, in the immediate aftermath of a shooting, most children uh, will have a lot of issues with paying attention and concentrating in school, because it's the hot topic, right? It just happened. And so they, they have a lot of concerns, they have a lot of worries, they're scared. Um, they can also become very irritable or defiant, right? Whenever uh, a person is very angry or irritated, you also need to consider that the underlying, the root feeling of that is fear. When somebody is very, very angry, I can assure you what they really are is afraid. But on the surface, what they project onto the world is anger, frustration, and irritability. Same thing with children. There's no difference. Uh, they may have trouble concentrating, obviously, or they may have a lot of separation anxiety issues. Well, the safest place I can be is in mom and dad's arms, so I'm just not going to leave that. And parents are struggling when they're dropping them off, um, or the, they get calls from the school, hey, the child you know, woke up from nap and they're still crying, or, you know, we're just having a lot of problems with them concentrating and focusing to do their work. Obviously, feelings of anxiety over what happened. And what does that mean for me? Okay. Is my school safe? Is there going to be extra security now? What, what are they going to do? You know? So they start to have a lot, a lot of questions. And not to mention, we could even see problems with sleep and appetite or changes in their general routine uh, following what happened. So what do we do? We want to talk about it. Not talking about it is not the solution. Oh, very soon, you know, the media will start, stop talking about it and it'll be forgotten. Um, so not talking about it makes it seem like it's, you know, a bigger threat than it might be, right? And so we, if our kids are asking questions, we need to provide answers. Right? It's like people ask me, like, when is it the right time to talk about uh, where babies come from? I'm like, when they ask you. Because if they're already asking, they're already there. Right? They're already curious. They've heard something. Um, silence can suggest that what occurred is not too, 
not as bad. Oh, it, 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 no te preocupes, a ti no te va a pasar nada. You don't worry. Okay? So we don't want to minimize things for them either because they know it's not a small thing. They know something major happened. And again, with social media, they know. How many of your kids in here, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but have a social media of some sort, either Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? They know. They know more than you probably want them to know about anything and everything. Okay? So it's out there. So especially because of that, it is very unlikely that your children or your adolescents are not aware of what might have happened. Um, so you want to start by asking your child, what have they heard about the event? Well, what do you know? What have you heard? You know, either through media or at school or your friends. What, what do you know? Oh, well, this and that and the other. And so what you really want to be looking for is misinformation. Okay? Listen carefully to figure out um, what he or she uh, knows or believes about the situation, right? What are their thoughts on it? And then as they are talking to you, again, listen for misinformation, misconceptions, and just their fears or concerns about the topic, right? If they are misinformed, if they, are, um, uh, if they misunderstood something, it's our job to correct that information, okay? We also don't want our child walking through the world with fears and anxieties based on something that's not true. So we want to be able to correct them when necessary. And understand that the information will change as more facts come about, right? Like, for example, and, and uh, when, we, when uh, this shooting happened here close to us, now we know way more than we knew in those first few days, right? But, you know, if we just go based on, what, on the information from the first few days, it would have been very difficult to process what really happened and understand what really happened. And then, obviously, uh, um, take, you know, take action uh, and consequences for people that might have been also responsible. So again, listen for misinformation and gently correct them. Again, don't offend the child. Don't say, no, no, no. I know. Your friends are just dumb. No, don't listen to your friends. No, say, say oh, okay, I, I can see why you might have heard that, but really, this is what happened. So you want to gently correct, right? Again, you don't want to offend them when their emotions may already be fragile. If your child does have inaccurate information, then take the time to clear things up in a language that they can understand, at a level that they can understand, right? What I always tell parents is, you are the expert of your child. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Okay? So you know, based on your child's age, stage of development, um, their vocabulary, where are they at? How do I have to explain it to them? Right? So choose your words carefully. And again, be a positive role model in these situations. Consider sharing your own feelings about it. And if you say, well, I'm mortified. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm a grandparent. I am mortified to send my kid to school now. It's okay to tell them that. Okay? But what we can also tell them is, I'm going to do everything in my power to protect you. Um, let me find out for you what your school is doing. Information is power, I always say. So what is the school doing? You know, okay, now nobody can get in unless they go through all these measures at the school. Don't worry, you're safe. Um, there's more security, there's more police officers, etc. And then um, if you are sad about it, it's okay to express that too, right? Because it is sad, because it is hurtful. So it's okay to admit that to your kids, right? For your kids to see you in a vulnerable stage is a very powerful thing. Right? Um, you can share if you, you are worried, but also it's very important to share ideas for, again, difficult uh, situations and, and such tragedies. And then speak of the quick response or whatever it is that happened with, with whoever took action, right? Maybe not in the case of Uvalde, but you know, what, what 
you know, there's been some recent uh, uh, shootings um, at, at stores and, and things like that. And so what is the action that is taken in such horrific events? Ah, the toughest thing I ask of parents, be patient. Patience runs thin these days because we want automatic answers to everything. But be patient, you know, in times of stress, the child may have a lot of trouble, again, with behavior, concentrating, and attention. So we want to be patient as they, too, are processing what happened. If we have a hard time processing these types of events, imagine for a child to understand, like, how could somebody do that to children, right? How do I explain to my three-year-old that somebody was obviously very mentally ill, but knew enough to plan something like that. Like, how, how, how do I do that? That's hard, right? So be very patient, um, find the words, right? And if you do decide, if you can't talk about it right there and then, because it's all so new, I, I know I had one parent tell me, I couldn't, I, I couldn't even talk about it. I would start crying, my, my voice would crack, I couldn't do it. It's like, it's okay to tell it to your child, we're gonna talk about that, but I need a little bit of time. But make sure you come back and talk about it when you're ready. Because if you never talk about it, then again, Children fill in the blanks. Well, is it so bad that mom can't even talk to me about it? Dad can't even mention the words? How bad was this thing? Should I be afraid? So you want to be able to do that. And again, give that extra patience, extra care, and extra love. And above all, be patient with yourself. Right? Again, we're human. We don't just get frustrated with others. We get frustrated with ourselves. Right? And so it's very important to also give yourself that self-love and that self-care to, to be patient with yourself and um, find the words. And like I said, you can always reach out for help. And there's a lot of resources, um, both nationally and locally. And so um, I am going to dive in the, in the few minutes we have left into services that are available to you in the community. And so we do have, um, well, first of all, how many of you have heard of SCAN before? Yay! Okay, SCAN, believe it or not, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. We've been around for 40 years, since 1982. We started off um, in terms of um, 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 spreading awareness for uh, child abuse and child neglect. But um, we have grown into many, many different uh, programs. So under SCAN, SCAN is a, is a big nonprofit. Under SCAN, there's many, many different programs that provide many, many different services for different age groups and for different areas of mental health. So whether it's um, mental health due to trauma or a mental health need due to a dependency on a substance, right? And we have programs for adults, for adolescents, for young children, okay? So we do have a trauma center um, um, and so the, the, the trauma uh, uh, stress response center, they, um, they do see minors, so any minor under the age of 18, as well as their parents, if the child experienced a traumatic event and is now ex exhibiting concerning behaviors due to that traumatic event. And then there's us, which is Border Project Launch. We deal with the real little ones, zero to eight, um, and, and their parents as well. And then we also have a um, emergency response program for people that maybe experience a severe, severe um, um, crisis, emotional crisis. So we do have that. And then most recently, we got a new program. It's called La Frontera, um, and it's for adults, and it's for mental health in general. So if you're experiencing anxiety, uh, stress, depression, the services are there. And again, they're all free. But to focus more on um, our program, which is Border Project Launch, our focus is, bottom line, the well-being um, of young children. So that is our focus. And the reason why we, there's so much emphasis on this, um, and the government gives grants to agencies like ours to do this work, is because of that um, persistence that we want to intervene and take action 
as early as possible. We don't want whatever the situation may be to grow into something we cannot handle later on. And especially if the child is living with a condition like the ones that I mentioned earlier, ADHD, um, um, autism, things like that, we want to diagnose early so that we can give parents the information they need and they know from there on how to proceed with their child and again, make informed decisions. So that's why we are big on early intervention. So one of the services that we provide, which is specifically the work that, that I do for um, our team, is the infant and early childhood mental health consultations. This is for parents with children zero to eight. And what I do, in mental health consultation is delivered in many different formats. The most common format is that we get a referral from the school and I go into the classroom with the consent of the parents, signed consent from parents, and I observe the child in the classroom to see what are the behaviors that are happening, what might be triggering the behavior, and based on that observation, be able to make best recommendations and referral for both the child's caregivers as well as the teachers. I work with teachers, right? Because like the saying goes, it takes a village, right? So it's not just the parents, I work with the teachers. I love working with teachers because I think they have a wealth of knowledge and experience to share. And so the areas that we're trying to improve on is again, you know, uh, the child's well-being, mental health, and again, if there is the need for a diagnosis, okay? And then we have consultation meetings and we take it from there. The other service we have is parent education sessions. We have a couple of evidence-based curriculums that we utilize. And so one of them is Triple P. Triple P stands for Positive Parenting Program. We do these via Zoom, so very convenient to join and log on. And we have different topics. They're universal topics that any caregiver can relate to from dealing with disobedience, managing behaviors like fighting and aggression, bedtime routines. Ooh, we get a lot of questions about bedtime routines. You know, they're like, how do I get my kid to sleep in their own bed? I'm like, okay, we can help you with that, all right? Um, and other topics like that. There's a total of five that, that we deliver through Triple P. And then we have safe care, which is for ch the really little ones, caregivers with children zero to five. This is an excellent program for expecting parents as well, especially if you're gonna be a first time parent. This is good information because it's all about, you know, preparing for baby or safe proofing the house for baby and young children. So this one, it is a home visitation service. So the, the parent educator goes into your home to provide uh, the classes. Then we have the more intensive um, intervention, which is PCIT, which stands for parent-child interaction therapy. This is an actual form of treatment. We have trained and certified counselors who do this full time. And this is a very, very beautiful therapy between parent and child. They come into our center. We have what's called playrooms. And we basically work with parents to teach them the skills to better communicate with their children, to have a more connected bond with their children, and to play with their children. I mentioned the power of play earlier. We literally teach parents to play with children. And you might say, Oh, please, ma'am, I know how to play with my child. Okay, I'll trust you with that. But do you understand what it means to play with a child? That means the TV's off, this is nowhere near you, and you're down on the floor being really, really um, um, involved with your child in play. And then anybody receiving services from us also has access to our part-time nurse practitioner for free health screenings. We do have that as well. This is our team. And so we are a pretty large team. Everybody specializes in different areas. And um, this is how you can contact us. But also I know that they passed around brochures. So everybody has uh, the information in terms of gotta get in contact with us. And here's the thing. If you say, well, my child is not, is older than eight years old. Call us anyways, because we will direct you to the service or program that might be a better match for your child and your situation, okay? 
Does anybody have any questions? Preguntas. I know that was a lot. We covered a lot. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I will be here. And so if anybody wants to come up and talk to me and get more information, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you. So again, we want to thank Ms. Guerra for, for sharing her, her knowledge, her experience, and the services that they provide in our community. Much needed, obviously. This is a topic that uh, we've been discussing for some time, and I know it is a topic of interest to you parents. So we will continue to do our best as a school district to make sure that we're providing the adequate resources and information to you all to make sure that we're working together uh, to ensure our students' overall well-being and success. So uh, before we close out and do our door prizes, you did receive um, a survey today. You know, parents, that it's very important for us that we get your feedback. We want to be able to know what your needs are so that we can serve you better. So please give us your feedback uh, this afternoon. And before we do our door prizes, we do have some very special guests with us. Um, this afternoon, if they can join me up here first, Mr. David H. Gonzalez, our superintendent of schools. Thank you for being here. This one, yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's important that we know your needs, so let us know the next topic. Can we talk about next topic for the next meeting? So they need to, they need to know so we can prepare for you. Uh, more than anything else, thank you for the support you've been giving us. We've had a lot of, a lot of success at UISD for many years. Todos los lo que damos tenido en el distrito, lo que damos tenido con el estado, con la A, we've been an A-rated district. Pero nada se hace sin el apoyo de los padres. I want to thank you. Nothing gets solved without the support that we give our parents. Uh, and as superintendent of schools, I am a teacher first, and I can never stop being that. So I wear my hat when I visit school and so forth. Uh, any issues you have at the campus, please report it to your administration there at the campus. If it is not solved, then let us know. We'll take care. We're here, we're here, we're here to service you and obviously to educate our students. But we have a very special guest, and I want to make it here. Normally, I'll come in, I'll be in the back, talk to some of you. But today, I do want to speak because I want to introduce uh, a new face to UISD as a board member, but not a new face to UISD, period, because she's also one of our parents. And this young lady, is our newest board member uh, who was recently elected and recently sworn in. And I want everybody to welcome Michelle Molina, and I want her to talk about a little bit about herself and the area she serves, it's because we want you to get to know our, our, our newest board member. Let's put our, our hats on and welcome Mrs. Michelle Molina. Ms. Molina. Michelle Molina, I'm your board member for District 6. Um, it's really an honor to be here today. I really appreciate to see this kind of response from our community. Uh, hopefully in the next coming workshops we get to see more of the community getting involved in these workshops because they're very useful. We learn a lot of great tips. I can tell you, I have three little ones. My oldest, Amanda, is 10 years old. She has autism. I have a six-year-old, uh, Zoe, and a five-year-old, Xander. And I can tell you that one of the exercises that we do at home every day is at dinner, we talk about highs and lows. And it gives them a platform to talk about anything, what they witnessed at school, what they saw, what they heard. And sometimes we may not have responses at the moment, but at, my husband and I will listen to it. And my husband's a principal at Seattle Middle School. And there's times where he even gives me coaching sessions of what he hears at school too. So that we can discuss that with our kids. And sometimes we don't have a great response for our kids at the moment when they're expressing themselves. And it can range from Rigo in the playground to this. And then I heard one of the teacher aides over here saying something else to another teacher, you know? And they, they hear a lot and they see a lot. So it's good to give them that platform. But at bedtime, we will talk to them and say, sweetheart, one of the things that you mentioned, do you remember this? And they say, yes. Well, wanted to let you know that it's good that you spoke about it, giving them that platform to talk about it, and putting their minds at ease that we did listen to them. So it's, it's a little exercise we do every day, highs and lows. So I'll share that with you. Um, but again, thank you so much for participating in this workshop. 
We all learn a lot as a mom, as a parent. Um, first and foremost, this is something that we, we definitely are interested in in seeing more workshops. I would love to hear more questions from the, the crowd, especially to everyone that's attending here today. Uh, please feel free. It's an open platform for everyone. So it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good day. So before we close out, parents, yes, we're going to, I told her to stay close by so she can help us out uh, with our door prizes. So get ready with your tickets. And we have, remember, we also have parents on Zoom. So we're, we have five prizes to give out today, four for our in-person attendees and one for our virtual participants. So first number. Zero eight two. Last three numbers. Zero eight two. We have a winner over here in the front. Yay, parents! Let's clap. <laughs> Congratulations. Zero eight zero. Wow, same table. And, and let me tell you something, parents. When some of you all were coming in, I know human nature, uh, as adults sometimes we want to sit in the back and we want to sit in the corner, but one of my staff members was telling you all, go sit in the front, that's usually where people win. And sure enough, I don't know where she's at, Norma, but she really did tell them that. And you saw here, look. We weren't cheating. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Congratulations. She wasn't lying. 722 one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right there. Right here in the front, also. Congratulations. Last one for in person. Last three numbers, one zero seven. One zero seven. One zero seven. There we go. Once again, uh, we're going to do our last prize, and that'll be done with our with our virtual uh, attendees, parents. We thank you so, so much for being with us today. Normally, we have a bigger crowd. I know that it, the, the weather maybe didn't help because a lot of us don't really care to leave our house. Uh, and I know a lot of people are also following the trial right now, so there's probably people hooked on that trial at home right now. But we do appreciate you coming in and spending uh, some of your time with us. We, we do value your time and, and your uh, attendance and your participation. Please give us your feedback. Our next meeting will be in February. We'll be sending that information out to you all. Don't forget about our family center, please. We have our family center located on Highway 83. I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of you have been attending a lot of our sessions there. So any services, anything we can do for, your par for you parents, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out. And then uh, I want to make sure that you all know that we have some popcorn and we have some animal crackers, some little extra snacks for you all to take with you today and to take uh, to your children. Yes. Yes. So we'll be around if you all have any questions or uh, would like to, to stick around and, and, and talk to uh, either Ms. Guerra, Ms. Molina, uh, or any of us. Please uh, feel free. Again, and our winner uh, online is Ms. San Juana Rodriguez. So Ms. Rodriguez, if you, you're still watching, please contact our office to make arrangements to pick up your prize. Once again, thank you everybody for being here. Have a wonderful rest of the week, a safe weekend. We wish you all happy holidays and a prosperous new year. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much.